our education system really had been designed for people. The core curriculum would be how to live, how to die. How to deal with the big issues in life, pain, aging, illness, death, separation. Because those are the things that plague people. And the skills for dealing with them are the most important skills that you can develop in life. One of the problems with our society is that everything is geared towards the economy. More and more we find laws are struck down because they are not good for the economy, at least for the immediate profit margin for this quarter. And education systems are designed to fit us into our slot in the economy. And those are the skills we learn. How to function well economically. Then when we get too old to function, they put us out to pasture. And we're pretty much left on our own design on our own devices. And a lot of times the skills we learned in order to be good members of the economy, good producers, good consumers, those are actually bad for us as we get older. This producing and consuming self we have here, this is a big problem. And so as we come here to meditate, which is actually to learn how to live and how to die, that's going to be one of the big issues we have to face down, this consuming and producing self. What does it consume? Well, it consumes feelings of pleasure, feelings of pain. And it tries to produce more and more pleasure. You look at your sense of who you are, it comes, really comes down to these two things, the producer and the consumer. So these are the habits that we have to look at as we look at ourselves. So when you meditate, the first thing you learn how to do is how to produce pleasure in the present moment. Not for the sake of the pleasure in and of itself, but you're going to use it as a strategy. So often for us, the pleasure is an end in and of itself, but the Buddha says, no, you can use pleasure and you can use pain, both of them, as means to a higher end. How do you use pleasure? Focus on the breath right now and see how it feels. And then experiment with the breath to see how the way you breathe can produce either pleasure or pain. It may be subtle, the difference between the two. But it's there. And because we've learned to desensitize ourselves to this aspect of our awareness, it's going to take a while to begin to see the patterns. This is why we practice. Keep coming back to the breath, coming back to the breath. So we get more and more sensitive to this area of our awareness and get more and more skilled at learning how to maximize the potential for pleasure right here and now, simply by the way we breathe. Not only producing pleasure, but also maintaining it. After all, feelings of pleasure and rapture are part of the path. They're tucked in the no blateful path under right concentration. As the Buddha said, this kind of pleasure is pleasure without drawbacks. It's a blameless pleasure. It's also a useful pleasure, because then you can use it to examine the pain. There may be in other parts of the body. When you sit here, it's, it's very difficult to get the whole body saturated in pleasure. It's possible from time to time. 
but you can't expect that it will always be nothing but pleasure in the body. There are going to be parts that you can't make pleasurable. pleasurable. So as a John Lee says, don't lie down right there. It's like knowing that there are rotten boards in your house on the floor. So if you try to lie down in that part of the floor, you're going to fall through to the basement. So lie down in the places where the boards are sound. And as that pleasure gets more and more solid, then you can start looking at the pain, because you've got a good vantage point. And hopefully the meditation by that point has taught you to be inquisitive. You've been learning about the breath. Well, how about these other parts that you can't make go as you'd like them to? What's, what's going on there? Is it related to the breath energy? That's one way you can deal with it. Think of breathing through the pain. See what that does. Or you can notice how you label the pain. There may be a mental image to go along with it. Try dropping the image. See what's left. In other words, you want to develop an, an inquisitive attitude into pain and put yourself in a position where you don't feel threatened by it. So you can probe and ask questions and watch and observe and learn about the pain. So that pain no, holds no mysteries for you. It holds no fear. Because you understand not only the sensation of pain, but you also see how the mind can latch onto it and create a lot of problems. And so you learn to abstain from those ways of latching on. It's like knowing you stick your finger into a flame, it's going to burn. So you stop sticking your fingers into flames. And as you do this, you learn more and more about the mind and more and more about ways to not get yourself involved in suffering. You may start out with little tiny pains, little tiny disturbances. But once you've figured them out, then you find that you're more interested. How about the bigger pains? This is probably one of the most important parts of the practice, is that willingness to rise to a challenge. So you don't feel overwhelmed by things. You've seen them, people who have problems in their lives and all they can think about is complaining, complaining, complaining. This isn't going right. That's not going right. People don't sympathize with me. And all they're doing is just piling more suffering onto the original suffering. They see a challenge, they see something difficult, and they just faint, or they whine and complain. That's not the Buddha's way. His way is to give you the skills, the tools you need, and then also try to fire you up to rise up to these challenges. Because if you don't rise up to the challenges, they are going to overcome you. So one way of making you ready for the challenge is to give you the tools so you're not totally defenseless. And the Buddha, in the story of his life, gives you examples. The stories of the noble disciples give the same examples, how you find yourself in a difficult situation and can rise above it, using your wits, using the resources you've got. So here we are with our breath, and we've got pain sometimes, we've got distractions at other times, sometimes both together. And we tend to regard them as the mosquitoes that are swarming around us as we meditate. We'd like to swat them and get rid of them so we can actually get down to the real business of meditating. But dealing with the distractions, dealing with the pain, that's the meat of the meditation. Because as we're saying today, when you die, the big problems are going to be distraction and pain. 
even before you die, as you get older. You probably notice this with old people. They can't look ahead into the future because all they see in the future is death. So they start looking behind, cut off large parts of their awareness. The mind just can't accept what's actually happening. And if they haven't been trained, just the, the pain and the depression of having to face death overwhelms them. And then when the actual pain of illness and aging and death comes, and they're even more overwhelmed. Because they don't have the tools, they don't have the, the right attitude for how to deal with these things. If you've been practicing meditation, you're, de you're dealing precisely with the big issues that are going to cause suffering as you die. The more skilled you get at the meditation, the more you'll be ready for whatever comes. And the more you have the right attitude, it's just one more challenge. But you've got your tools. So when illness comes, you can deal, it, deal with it lucidly. When death comes, you can deal with it lucidly, with a sense of confidence. You've dealt with pain and distraction in the past, so the basic principles are the same. So when things like pain and distraction come up in the meditation, get discouraged. Okay, these are the problems to deal with. These are the things you want to learn how to figure out how to spar and parry, how to sidestep when you have to, how to take them on straight on when you have to. And don't get discouraged by how big the, the task is. You just keep chipping away, chipping away. This is another thing we don't learn from our education system, is how to deal with something we're not good at right from the very beginning. So often they find that you're good at something and they channel you in that direction. Without teaching them the important skills you need for doing things you're not good at. In other words, getting good at something that's not immediately easy for you. So that's another attitude you have to develop, how to deal with a long-term project. Keep chipping away, chipping away, learning to look for signs, the least little signs of progress, so you can give yourself encouragement. And how to learn how to take things step by step. Of course, the world doesn't throw things at you step by step. Sometimes big pains come, and then little pains, and big pains again. But do what you can. And don't forget that this every step you take in the right direction is an important step. It's not wasted. And don't go for the easy out, say, well, I'm just here to lurk, hang out in the present moment and enjoy the present moment. Who cares about striving for something large? I don't know how many times I've read stories of meditation teachers who claim that that's the secret to a good meditation, is to stop try, trying, to stop striving. That you drive yourself crazy, you just pile more suffering on yourself because you're striving, so learn how to let go and just appreciate the way things are. And they forget to think, well, maybe they were striving in the wrong direction. It's like that passage in the suttas where the Buddha compares the right path to the wrong path. So if you practice with wrong view and wrong resolve and wrong effort, it's like trying to squeeze gravel to get sesame oil. And so a lot of people are in their meditation are squeezing gravel to get sesame oil, and they finally realize this doesn't make any sense. You stop squeezing the gravel. And then they stop there, and they celebrate how great it is to stop squeezing gravel. 
thinking that that's the secret to good practice. Well, it's a good practice. It's an important step. But the path actually consists of finding sesame seeds and squeezing the sesame seeds. It may take some effort, but at least it provides real results. So if you find yourself pushing, 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 and nothing's coming from it, ask yourself, am I squeezing gravel to get sesame oil? In which case, you better back up a little bit. Take stock of your practice and do what you can to get it back on the right path. But don't think that giving up in the effort is going to be a solution. It's just learning how to apply the effort skillfully. And learning how to read the results of your actions. This is another skill that we've got to develop. Look at what you're doing, seeing if it's right by checking the results. Seeing the connection between what you do and the results. And having the imagination to realize that the only it's not the only alternative to stop squeezing gravel. There is the etern alternative of finding the sesame seeds and squeezing the sesame seeds. That way you get the oil. And the oil here is really priceless. After all, it's the deathless. Once you touch that in your meditation, then you have your safe place. You have your secure place. It doesn't have to be built up. doesn't have to be protected. It's there. And it will always be there for you to tap into when you really need it. So finding that is the most important skill that you can work at. It's the most satisfying narrative to your life, because so many times the narrative of people's lives is what? They were born and they struggled and went through all sorts of difficulties and then got sick and died. And if they were lucky, maybe they got to do some good things for their fellow human beings, but then they still just grow sick and die. But if you touch the deathless, that makes a very different because if you don't touch it, the question is, well, what was this all about? What's accomplished by all that struggle? Because whatever you do in time and space is going to get changed someday. But if you touch something that's outside of time and space, then you've, your life hasn't been wasted. The narrative arc is really satisfying. Because once you found the deathlets, it's always there to depend on. And you always have something to show for your efforts. <laughs>